This episode of To The Journey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, this is Robert Duncan McNeil, also known as Tom Paris from Star Trek Voyager. You're listening to Trek FM. I think it's safe to say that no one on this crew has been more obsessed with getting home than I have. But when I think about everything we've been through together, maybe it's not the destination that matters. Maybe it's the journey. And if that journey takes a little longer so we can do something we all believe in, I can't think of any place I'd rather be or any people I'd rather be with. To the journey. You're here. To the journey. 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 Hello, everybody at home, and welcome. This is To the Journey. I'm your co-host, Suzanne Williamson, and with me, as always, is... Zachary Fruling. Well, depending on how quickly I can get this episode edited, it might be dropping on Valentine's Day. So what do you say we talk about some romance in Voyager? I don't know what you think about this, Suzanne, but I like to think of Voyager as the most romantic of the Star Trek series. Do you do you concur with that? Uh, I guess you could say that. I mean, TNG had plenty of romance and so did Deep Space Nine. But yeah. In preparing for the episode, I put together a pretty impressive list of romance on Voyager. Much more than I thought there was, actually, before I started working on the list. Well, I saw your list when you were halfway through with it, and it was missing something very, very important. And I'm glad, looking at it now, that you did not neglect that one episode. You mean the most important episode was not top of mind, which is, (laughs) what are you referring to? It involves making headboards and bathtubs, so I think you know which episode (laughs) I'm talking about. It must be Resolutions. It must be. It always must be. If you're thinking about romance on Voyager, nothing is better than Chakotay building things for Catherine. It's interesting you say that because that is actually not my go-to romantic Voyager episode. Mine is someone to watch over me. I knew you were going to say that. I absolutely knew you were going to say that. How did you know that? that? Because you love that episode. I do. I absolutely love that episode. You're right. It is a good episode, but romance-wise, it just doesn't do it for me. I think it's because of the the lobster being torn apart. Yeah, I guess you're right. Lobster on the face kind of takes away some yes. of the some of the atmosphere. I like. The, I think I like the musical part of it. You do like when they the sing. doctor and seven singing together. Yeah, I do. That gets me every time. I still say nothing's better than the bathtub, but to each their own. So I guess when we're talking about romance on Voyager, we need to talk about romance in what sense? Are we talking like real romance, like genuine romantic relationships? Because we have those in in Voyager. You know, we've got Tom and Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe as the most romantic couple in all of Star Trek. The most realistic couple in all of Star Trek, I would say. Right. Then there are a lot of romantic moments. I haven't tried to count the number of romantic moments in Voyager compared to Next Generation or Deep Space Nine. There's an awful lot of alien romance in Voyager, I think, compared to other (laughs) Star Trek series. It might even rival Captain Kirk in the original series. There are a lot of alien visitors on Voyager that like to stay over, if you will. Some Star Trek series are known for the bad guy of the week. Voyager is known for the alien romance of the week. I was going to go with alien hookup, but yeah, I'll, I'll take alien romance too. Well, you know, there's a, well, that's what I mean. Romance in what sense, right? Yeah. I thought you were more along the lines of romance in actual real flesh and blood people or with holograms because we get plenty of that too. Holograms count. Holograms are people too. Holograms are people too. Yes. 
Well, when I started preparing, I tried to come up with a list of the most romantic episodes in Voyager, and I had trouble with that because there aren't that many purely romantic episodes. I think maybe we talked about them already. Resolutions is romantic. Someone to watch over me is romantic. I would classify those episodes as romantic episodes. Then there are a bunch of episodes that have romantic moments, romantic themes, but not really a romantic episode per se. They're just moments. And then there are an awful lot of alien romances. (laughs) I had more fun with that list, honestly, (laughs) but... Um, which aspect of romance and Voyager do you find most interesting? Going back to it, with romantic episodes, you have to throw in the Q and the Gray. Because, I mean, there's romance all over that episode coming from Q. Unwanted romance, mind you, but still. Just because Q puts a bunch of red hearts on Captain Janeway's bed? And a puppy. Don't forget the puppy. And a puppy. <laughs> and there's a puppy in it. Okay. Yes. And then there are also the bad romances in Voyager. There are like, you know, the alien romances that are deceptive or manipulative, mm-hmm. that, are not, that are not real romances, but are kind of romantic, but they kind of go south because something's wrong. Yes, there are plenty. There are a few of those as well. Kashik. Kashik is a great example of that, exactly. But you think Q in the Gray is, a, is would count as a romantic episode? I could, I could see that. Definitely I, it's a romantic episode. I would have to extend my, my view just a little bit. but Because we have Chakotay getting jealous of Q's advances on Catherine. We have oh, yeah. Ch- Lady Ch- Q Chakotay's showing up, so time. we have other jealousy going on there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's... See, I would put that one in the category of, like, it's a caricature of romance, right? It's not... There's no real romance with Q. It's kind of, you know, he's... He's, uh, he's trying his best. Using all the romantic stereotypes. And if that's his best, <laughs> he's not very good at it. <laughs> he's just not as practiced as you are, Zachary. That's all. Oh, thanks, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> so which, should we stick more with romantic moments instead of episodes? We'll have more to cover. I guess that's my point, that there aren't that many purely romantic episodes, even though I think Voyager is probably the most romantic series in, in all of Star Trek. Um, there are a lot of episodes with ro- romantic moments, but really, we're talking about moments. We're not really talking about whole episodes that are romantic. You can count those on one hand. Honestly, you don't tune into Star Trek to watch romance, do you? No, it's an added bonus here and there, but that's not the reason you tune in. That's not the only reason. (laughs) It's a reason. (laughs) It can be a reason. Who are you to tell me what my reason is? It's not the main reason, (laughs) is what I'm saying. It is not the main reason you watch Star Trek. No, that's true. It's true. It's, it's It's a relatively small part of it. That's true. Just an added bonus here and there. I'll give it a number. It's like 20%. <laughs> That's pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking more like 2%. <laughs> I was going to say 5 to be optimistic. <laughs> okay. We'll call it 10 and split the difference. Okay. <laughs> okay that works. <laughs> we'll take it to 11. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Romance on Voyager, it, it, it goes to 11. Yeah. So which kind of romantic moments on Voyager do you find most interesting? Because we have a lot of pairings on Voyager. We've got Janeway and Chakotay. Everyone knows where we stand on that. Chakotay and Seven. Boo. Boo. Everyone knows where we stand on that. We have Tom and Blana. Thumbs up. Everyone knows where we stand on that. We have Kess and Neelix. Creepy. (laughs) Yeah. Mixed feelings about Kess and Neelix. Exactly. We have an alternate timeline with Tom and Kess, which I find remarkably charming. Uh, Not so much, but. No, you don't like that one? Okay. The Doctor and Seven, the best missed opportunity in all of Star Trek. Definitely. Yay, exactly. Thumbs up. And we have um, Harry Kim and almost everyone that fails. Yeah. (laughs) Harry Kim and the Delaney sisters, Harry Kim and Libby. Harry, yeah. Harry doesn't have a lot of luck in that department. Yeah. Poor Harry. So... And then there are all these other moments with all of our favorite characters and the aliens of the week, which can be remarkably charming mm-hmm. as well. So we can we can spend a little time talking about our favorite pairings, our favorite moments in those pairings, or our fa- favorite alien romance of the week. Well, even though I don't like the pairing, seeing Chakotay and Se- holographic Chakotay and Seven was kind of nice if I take out the fact that it's Chakotay. That was pretty romantic. 
That's that's a really good point, Suzanne. We need to clarify because we're, when we're talking about Chakotay and Seven, some of the best romantic scenes are not actually with Chakotay. They're with hologram Chakotay. Yes. I would like to meet hologram Chakotay. He seems nice. You want to date with holographic Chakotay. Okay. <laughs> if I had a holodeck, you know I'd be programming that in right now. But despite the fact that you don't like Chakotay and Seven in general, you think mm-hmm. those scenes are... They're very romantic, now, very sweet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If I just can remove the fact that it's Chakotay. And it's fun to watch Seven develop to the point where she's entertaining the notion of a, of a romantic relationship. You know, she's so rigid and, and so non-emotional yes. when she first, you know, when we first encounter her. And it, it's it's an interesting development to see her warming up to, to other types of human interactions. Well, it's definitely because the doctor has pushed her in that direction. Yeah, she largely has the doctor to thank for that. Mm-hmm. But I, like I said, I think it's a missed opportunity. They didn't do that with the doctor. It would have yes. been... A, a much more natural fit. I, I I think when when fans look at Chakotay and Seven, they go, "Why? It just doesn't make sense. There's no chemistry, even even given the strength of those hologram scenes or holodeck scenes. I uh, I just think there's no real chemistry there. And with the, the the Doctor and Seven is is a really unlikely pairing, but they have great chemistry they when they, when they when they flirt like 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 in Someone to Watch Over Me. It's what I love mm-hmm. about that episode. That you know every moment they have together on screen, they just they're a natural fit. Yeah. That would have been so Yeah, they help each other grow. (laughs) So of these different pairings, Mm -hmm. Janeway slash Chakotay, Chakotay slash Seven, Tom slash Bolana, I'm recapping here, Kess slash Neelix, Tom slash Kess in the alternate timeline, Doctor (laughs) slash Seven, and which of those have your favorite romantic moments? Not necessarily the pairing, but which moments? Oh... I know okay, it's really okay, hard. Okay. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Favorite romantic moment? Jane yes. Chicote. The Midnight Sail. Oh, perfection. Champagne, Midnight Sail, just the two of them. Hello. And I love they don't actually show it. They just show them going, you know, leaving leaving her ready room, going to the That's what makes it so great sale. because your imagination can take it <laughs> anywhere. And believe me, mine has. And I wrote a few stories about it. And I've read a lot of stories about it. Wait, wait, wait. Does this really count? It's it's your favorite romantic moment between Janeway and Chakotay, but it's not actually shown. It's implied, <laughs> but it's still your favorite moment. So are you trying to say it didn't actually happen because it happened? No, a lot of the best things in Voyager never actually happened, right? So many alternate true. timelines and things get unwritten and whatever. <laughs> Scrafote. Yes. Scruffy Chicote. Scrafote. Scruff, wait, how did you say this? Scruffote. Scruffote? <laughs> Scruffy Chicote from Year of Hell never actually happened. Scruffy Chicote. That's right. So Janeway Chicote, Midnight Sail, even though it never was actually shown, it's just implied yes. as your f- absolute favorite moment. Absolute favorite. Okay. What? What is your absolute favorite if that's not it? Okay, quick clarification on the question, Suzanne. Yes. Is this a favorite moment amongst the pairings amongst romantic pairings amongst the characters you just listed during not the necessarily recap. in general because they're all the alien they're, they're alien romance of the week we're not talking about those we're yeah. talking about among our core characters yes i think for me it would have to be the moment in someone to watch over me where seven is on the date with lieutenant chapman and that date kind of goes south you know she's mm-hmm. sprains his arm or whatever she does she hurts him and and she's feeling despondent, like she doesn't. She thinks she ruined it. She's not any good at this. And the doctor consoles her, and they end up dancing and having a wonderful moment in the holodeck together. I think that that would be my my kind of. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, well, that's not what I had picked in my head that I thought you were gonna say. Ooh, what did you think I was gonna say? I thought for sure you were gonna go with Tom and Bellana out in space during Day of Honor, where they're starting to lose consciousness, no. and Bellana's like, "I love you." Come on, that's kind of romantic. They're about to die, and she finally admits how she feels. I guess, you know, I, I don't think good romance needs to have a near-death scene associated <laughs> with it. So, when so. it involves a Klingon, it does. <laughs> Only when it involves a Klingon. Yes. Okay. <laughs> They're very passionate people. Yeah, that, that's why you read Shakespeare in the original Klingon. Yeah. Exactly. No, um, for some reason... You would think that would be high on the list, but that that scene kind of falls flat for me for some reason. I don't 
It's hard to characterize why, because it is kind of a romantic scene. They're about to die. Mm -hmm. They're floating in space. They're running out of oxygen. They're confessing their feelings for each other. But something about it just kind of eh, makes me go, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. That scene, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah, and you, when you're looking for romance, you don't want to end up with eh. Right, exactly. You want something a little more upbeat than that. Okay, so you want upbeat. Okay, if it's not the Doctor and Seven dancing in the holodeck, it's mm -hmm. definitely the Doctor and Seven sing singing um, You Are My Sunshine. I could okay. That's probably a better moment. Actually, I will, I will replace my, my earlier choice with. It's officially now. You are my sunshine. Okay, so still same episode, just different scene. Yes, it's no, no. It's definitely still someone to watch over me. That's my go-to. Like I said, that's my go-to episode. Okay. Do we have a favorite moment for each of these, though? Okay, so we talked about Janeway Chakotay. That's your favorite in general moment. Yes. By ipso facto, it's your favorite Jane, Janeway Chakotay moment. Yes. We talked about your Chakotay 7 moment, even mm -hmm. though you're lukewarm on, on Chakotay. Not even lukewarm. You hate Chakotay 7, but you love their, their holographic moments. As long as I can take Chakotay out of the picture and it's just some random dude. Oh, it would be better if you replaced Chakotay with someone else. Okay. <laughs> yes. Replace him with Michael Sullivan. That would make sense. There we go. Okay. I have to say, I, even though we weren't talking about... Our, our, the other romance we were talking about our core characters Fairhaven uh, is really high on my list I think bleh. no I love I love Janeway and Michael Sullivan as you know and I think Fairhaven is high on my romantic episodes list if only because of them <sighs> see, okay if we're going with Janeway and someone else other than Chakotay it has to be Kashik. come on at least he was her intellectual equal Michael Sullivan she had to manipulate and do all kinds of things Kashik was awesome he was slimy, but he was awesome. I'm torn because there are two different types of romances here. We've got we've got a we've got a genuine romance mm -hmm. that is, doesn't have anything really wrong with it per se, and then we've got you know the romance with the, the Kashuk type romance where it seems romantic, but really it's manipulative and it's not what it seems. So it's not a real romance. So I don't think of that as like a real romance. I think of Janeway slash Michael Sullivan as more of but a real romance. You could actually put Janeway as the Kashuk character when you pair her with Michael Sullivan, because she is manipulating him and changing him. So Kashuk is to Janeway as Janeway is to Michael Sullivan. Yes. There you go. That'll be on the next SAT exam. Everyone pay attention. <laughs> right. So do you, do you count those quasi-romantic slash not quite genuine romantic romances as as actual romance should we consider those as romantic episodes or romantic scenes because they're not genuine i think we can because i mean it still happens on the screen whether it's genuine for both people or not there's still mm -hmm. a little bit of romance going on now you could go okay a different direction where it is romantic for both people like the doctor and dinara pell and life signs. Yes, yeah, oh. I would put that more in the. That's a that's a genuine romance. That right? that's is not, genuine. Yes. So th for me, that outweighs Kashik a hundredfold. Oh, me too. But we're talking about the Doctor there, not Janeway. Well, let's keep going down our list. So we 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 we've talked about t Tom and Blana a little bit. Mm -hmm. I presume your favorite Tom Blana moment is floating in space, since you mentioned it. No, for Tom and Blana romance, it's not really something we see on screen. It's finding out that Bolana gave Tom a television set as a gift. And we found that out, I believe, in Memorial. And that's just sweet right there. That's so sweet. Okay, that is really awesome because there are different types of, uh, how to put it, there are different love languages. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows this, right? There are, people speak different love languages. And one of the love languages is getting a gift. And I think that Bolana getting Tom a television set conveys that she truly understands who he is exactly. and what he will love and she goes out of her way to think of something that she doesn't care about at all but she knows he will love mm -hmm. and it's it, it's such a it says so much about how she feels about him and how well she knows him it, it's that to me is romantic and of course tom immediately loses himself in the television <laughs> it included a remote control which is sweet because looking looking at the TV that he got, it didn't look like it would have come with a remote because it was like a giant console looking thing. Yeah, she took the time to engineer a, a remote control for a 1950s television set. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of thought went into that. So good job, Bolana. Okay, I, I wouldn't have anticipated that. So that's good. Well, let's keep going down the list. How yeah. about um, Kess and Neelix? Uh, I don't really have one for them. <laughs> 
And that's, that, I feel bad about that, but I just, I don't have, yeah. yeah the the best you. part of the romance is when it ended. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best because they just didn't, they didn't belong together. Both great characters. They just, they did not together. Enough said about Cass and Neelix, apparently. Well, did you not have one for them? Aha, so we're in agreement. I'm thinking, I'm trying really hard to think of one. I can't think of one. <laughs> <laughs> so we do agree, haha. Kick me off the network. I'm a bad Voyager podcaster. I can't think of one. Okay, so skipping Kess and Neelix, uh, I guess that leaves us with Tom and alternative Kess, or alternative Tom and alternative Kess, or however you want to call them. Yeah, I don't know if they, if I can pinpoint a favorite moment. Mm -hmm. I just think it's charming that Kess is aging. You know, she's essentially elderly at this point, and Tom is still clearly in love with her. Like, you know, physical appearance doesn't matter to him. Age doesn't matter to him anymore. And I don't know. Maybe maybe it falls a little flat for you. It doesn't for me. I think it's remark. I think it's charming and totally works. But yeah, I was more focused on what else was going on in that episode as as opposed to them. Yeah, I just think it, it just came across that he he still cared about her and loved her and yeah. found her attractive and lots of lots of other things, even even given that she's aging much, much faster than him. So I don't know if it's a moment. It's just, you know, his overall demeanor towards it works for me. Okay. Well, does that leave anybody in our core group? There aren't really any other core romances, right? We haven't yeah. missed anyone. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Oh, oh who'd we miss? Oh, Seska. No, Seska is Seska a core character? Really? For no, the first she, two she seasons, yes, she then... was. <laughs> hmm. She didn't make the cast photos. She wasn't. She wasn't a bridge officer. I'm gonna guess that's why she didn't make the cast photos. Okay, that's true. So you're thinking Seska and Chicote? Yes. Right. Even though, yeah. I did not like it, but that's still a this core. This doesn't fall in the genuine romance category, right? Oh, heck no. She's a Cardassian. This is a Kashuk romance. <laughs> I love that we've, I love that Kashuk has become our, our <laughs> prototypical, you know, stereotypical typification of a bad romance. Yes. Of course, now Lady Gaga's bad romance is playing in my head. Was there a good Seska Chicote moment that you can think of? No, no, there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was kind of a romance. I don't know. Eh. If you're stealing someone's DNA, that may not count as a real romance, right? It could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not, though. If there's any, if there's any romance, I'm going to sing, you know, Lady Gaga bad romance song to. This is definitely a Lady Gaga bad romance. Yes. So I have to admit, I have more fun with the alien romances than with the the core character romances. I think they're just more fun. I, you can go down the list and let me let me just give a quick overview, and we can we can kind of talk about whichever ones we want. But I'm going to read okay. my list because I think this is this is fascinating. You're we so have happy Jane about Lane your Kashuk, list, which we talked about. <laughs> I am. I'm proud of this because it's it's way longer list than I thought. So Jane Wayne Kashuk, mm-hmm. Harry Kim and Darren Tall in The Disease, Harry Kim and Udana in Prime Factors, which is kind of a romance. You had to kind of stretch a little bit to get it in there. Yeah. Jane Wayne and Goth oh. in Prime, also in Prime oh, Factors. Oh no, no, <laughs> not crazy. Yeah, yeah. Dude. Right? No, let me go. Neelix and Cherega, the Klingon in Prophecy. <laughs> Neelix and Dexa. In Homestead. Okay. Tuvok and Nas in Gravity. We have Blana and Dothan in Memories. Janeway and Jaffin in Workforce. Ugh. Seven of Nine in Axum in Unimatrix Zero. <laughs> okay, I start. This is not really an alien romance, but I kind of snuck it in there because it's more of like a one off. <laughs> Tom Paris and Rain Robinson in Future's End. She's not an alien, but, you know, they're from different time periods. So, you know, by extension. Fake Tom and Fake Blana in Course Oblivion. Oh. Right, they're not. They're aliens. Yeah, they're Aww. aliens. Chakotay and Valerie Archer from Species Eight Four Seven Two in In the Flesh. Chakotay and Kellen in Unforgettable. Tuvok and Morena in Alter Ego. The Doctor and Dinara Pell in Life Signs. And Voyager even has its own romance from these space dwelling life forms in Elogium. You forgot 
Chicote and yeah, I knew this was thorough. I knew, not exhaustive, but thorough. But no, oh, the Borg lady, Riley Fraser. Oh yeah, you forgot Chicote and Riley Fraser. Add that to the list. That's a pretty impressive list. I think. I think. I think this is more alien romance than you get in most other Star Trek series. What do you think? I don't know. Uh, Riker made the rounds in Next Gen. Is Riker's list equal to this list? <laughs> I think we Ry- need to do a comparison. I think Riker's list uh, is much longer. Well, that's true. So Riker's list. Well, I guess that's my question. Riker's list is longer than any one of these characters' lists, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But is Riker's list equal to the sum of all the Voyager <laughs> alien romances? It might be. Is Riker's list as good? Probably not. No, no, probably not. These are probably much more interesting than Riker's list, actually. Yeah. Riker's a little more Kirkian in that regard. <laughs> is that a word? It is now. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> I guess my point is there are some genuine romances here in the alien romances. And Riker is, I, I, I don't know if Riker has any genuine romances in his alien romance. He has a couple, maybe. Well, definitely in that list that you just gave would be Doctor and Dinara Pell. Hands down. Genuine romance. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what? So let's go through these. Which of these are genuine romances? Janeway and Kashuk, not a genuine romance. No, no, not at all. Harry Kim and Darren Tall. I'd yes, say genuine. Definitely a genuine romance. Yes. Okay. Harry Kim and Udonna. We don't know enough. It doesn't develop. It's yeah. just a, you know, they go on a date, right? It's, yeah. Doesn't even, we don't even get that. Harry far. tried. We'll give him that. He tried. How about Janeway and Goth? I think that's a little hard oh, to categorize. Oh, creepy dude. No, no. Creepy dude. He was just using her for new things. Oh, yeah, and he was incapable of, like, actual feeling, yeah, right? Yeah, so. and he was creepy. Right, okay. And he was creepy, yes. Yes. And... <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so not a genuine romance. Neelix and Cherega. Possibly. I think it possibly... It may not be a romance. Def- they definitely had passion on their side, but it may not may not have developed into a romance. It was lust, not romance. It might have developed... If, if Cherega had stayed on, on Voyager, maybe it had, would develop that way, but it, it didn't... They didn't get the chance to. Yeah. Neelix and Dexa. Definitely genuine romance. Neelix leaves Voyager for Dexa. Yeah. And... and uh, oh, good. What's, what's her son's name? <gasps> Bra- d- d- Brax? Brax? I want to say Prax. it's Brax. 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 No. <laughs> Not Prax. <laughs> That's Prax. Brax with a B, I think. <laughs> I think you're right. So definitely a genuine romance. Neelix leaves Voyager for Dexa and Brax. And, and they and they turn into a family. That, yeah. I can't believe Neelix left. I would say that that's one of the best romances in all of Star Trek. You know, I mean, how often do you see a main character leave the show because of a romance? Hmm. They just didn't want to take him back to Earth. I think that's what it was. They're like, oh, let's find him a woman, drop him on an asteroid. There you go. Hey, he could have got a job cooking at Cisco's or something. He was, you know, boning up on his American cooking. Earth cuisine? Out. Yes. Right. Okay, how about Tuvok and Nas? Mm. I would say genuine. I would say genuine romance. It didn't really develop, but it was genuine. It was genuine. Nothing not genuine about that. It was genuine, and Tuvok fought it as as well as he could. Yeah, it just didn't get time to develop for one reason or another, but it was genuine, I'd say. Yes, definitely. Now, it's not really B'Elanna, because it's not really her. Mm -hmm. It's more of a a memory, but B'Elanna and Dothan. I'm going to say not genuine. Because uh, it's not yeah, her. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not, not It's not even really Blana, yeah. right? It's, it's romantic. You know, it's from romantic, passionate scenes, but it's not really her, so it doesn't count. Janeway and Jaffin and Workforce. Definitely not. Again, not really Janeway. It, well, it is Janeway, but it's not Janeway. It is because not. Because not remember who she is. No. Mm-mm. Not genuine. No. Okay. Seven of nine in Axum. Definitely in genuine. Zero. Genuine or not. Definitely genuine. Definitely genuine. Okay. We have a two thumbs up on the genuineness in the Unimatrix. Okay. <laughs> Tom Paris and Rain Robinson. Uh, nothing happened. Yeah, again, it didn't. It was genuine, but it didn't really develop. So yeah. is it really a romance? Uh, yeah. It could have been. It was flirtation. I still think it would have been fun for Sarah Silverman to come on Voyager. I, that would have I, been, I, I <laughs> really been awesome. I could. I think I think that's a huge missed opportunity that would have been awesome. Yeah. 
I don't really care for her comedy so much. She's a little vulgar for me, but um, oh, but I that love character her. was awesome, and it would have been great. Yeah, do you? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. You know how much of a potty mouth I have. I know, and yet we we have our own little comedic banter so well, and it, it's so funny that our instincts are so different in that regard. Yep. I'm the straight man to your Sarah Silverman. Got it. <laughs> uh, I, I no, not on this show. I I can't curse that much. <laughs> one day one day i will be able will to curse off. that much <laughs> the line will be redrawn and yes. you will be able to curse this much on a podcast just wait <laughs> listeners one day okay so how about fake tom and fake bolana in course oblivion the silver blood bolana and silver blood tom definitely genuine and so sad so yeah sad. they come to an untimely end you know Okay, so genuine, even though they're fake. That's odd. It's genuine, even though it's not really them. That's <laughs> <laughs> Voyager's weird that way. It's weird as part of the job, right? Exactly. In Voyager. Chakotay and Valerie Archer no. are fake Valerie Archer. We don't even know if Valerie Archer is a real person. Species 8472. See, I think this is genuine. No. No, 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 no. Now, no. it's not at first, because Species 8472 is planning a war on the Federation, well, but... And also, Chakotay was just there for information, so, you know, it wasn't really... At ready. first. Yeah. But by by the end, they're ready to plan a second date. No, I don't think so. After he saw her, you know, give her that shot in her leg, and it kind of did that lizard thing, I think that turned him off. Oh, okay. We actually disagree on this one. I would put this one in the genuine category. It was like, don't. lizard that's, that's person... Maybe not. Chakotay doesn't mind. He's not prejudiced. <laughs> okay. I'm glad we disagree on one because generally we're both giving two thumbs up or two thumbs down here. I give a thumbs up Chakotay, Chakotay and, and fake Valerie Archer. We don't even know if Valerie Archer is a real person, right? right? We presume, presumably it's based on someone. I'm going to guess know. that she is because, you know, they had Booth be there. Right. Exactly. So I, I was thinking they, you know, went through the Federation's yeah. personnel files and, 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 made themselves in the image of, of real people, but I could be mistaken about that. I, I hadn't thought about it. No, I'm, I'm going to go with that too. Okay. So like I said, thumbs up for me, thumbs down from you. Mm-hmm. Chakotay and Kellen in Unforgettable. <sighs> oh, I got to give this a thumbs up. I was going to go thumbs down. <laughs> really? We disagree on this one too? Yes, because how do we know she wasn't <laughs> manipulating him to begin with since she can make everybody's, you know, memories of her disappear? If she has that ability, she could also be manipulating him into thinking, yes, you like me. Kellen is kind of like that character Derulio from the Orville. Yeah. With the pheromones. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is that genuine or not? Because those factors matter, right? You know, pheromones they do. affect people's romantic sensibilities that's not fake right just because just because something like that's going on doesn't mean that it's fake but no but it's manipulative therefore falling into the cash category by the end of the episode is it manipulative i think so it was manipulative the whole time chemistry and they seem to hmm i don't know i think there's a genuine something there but okay so we disagree on this one yes. as well this is great Tuvok and Morena in Alter Ego. Does this even count as romance? I don't know. <laughs> no, it counts as a stalker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, you're right. Morena's a stalker. It doesn't count. She was. Right? And then poor Harry was collateral damage in that episode. Yeah, like twice over. Yeah. She wasn't that into him in the first place. And then, of course, she's manipulating Tuvok. So she's just not that into there. you. <laughs> she's just not that into Harry, yeah. Okay, so no, definitely two thumbs down on Tuvok and Morena. Yeah. The Doctor and Denara Pell, two thumbs oh, up. Way up. If I had more thumbs, there would be more thumbs. I love them yep, together. Yep. They are just the cutest. And so I sweet. know. Why do oh. they do that? They make they introduce something so wonderful and then it's just a one off and it goes away. Right? And glad they brought her back. I was that, gonna say that. she was on that second time on resolutions. Yeah, but you know, some with with on screen chemistry that great, you want to make that a recurring character. Yeah, you know, that but was so good. Maybe that's why we're. Maybe the fact that they didn't do that is why we feel that way. And maybe if they had done that, we wouldn't be so ooh, ooh ah over it. But yeah, yeah. okay, two thumbs up on the Doctor and Denara Pell. Yes. And how about Voyagers' piece of the action <laughs> in Elogium? 
Oh, but Voyager loses its sex appeal by the end. <laughs> yes. Is that possible? <laughs> I guess it is. And then there's the one you mentioned that I had forgotten, Chakotay and Riley Frazier. Definitely not. She was just using him. Yep. Two thumbs down. I'm glad we disagreed on a couple, but generally we agree. But there are, there are quite a few genuine romances here. Oh, definitely. You have any favorites? Which of these do you do you like the best? The Doctor and Dinara Pell is super oh, yeah, high on the is, list. Yeah, that is my absolute favorite. Okay, let, let's get down into the B-grade one. There are the A-grade ones, like the Doctor and Dinara Pell, two thumbs up. Okay. We've got Neelix and Dexa, two thumbs up. Let's get rid of those. Okay. The B-grade ones. Which ones are your favorite B-grade ones? Uh, Seven and Axum. It's interesting that that one actually falls a little flat for me, too. I don't find it super memorable, even though I, I, I love it and I appreciate it. But it's, it's not high on my list. I would, I would go Tom Paris and Rain Robinson. Well, I do like that they continue Axum in the books. So we do get more Axum. Hashtag oh, yeah, this read is the another books. Hashtag read the books. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I like Harry Kim and Darren Tall. Okay. I, I think they're super cute together. That and it's nice to see Harry thrown a bone once in a while. Yeah, once in a great while. Uh, Tuvok and Nas. I know love that's it. one love of your favorites. About it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I love everything about it. Janeway and Kashik. And I feel naughty for saying that, uh, but something that is ab- naughty of you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> something about Kashik. It's just like he's slimy. I know. It's like I like you, but I hate you. <laughs> He's he's suave, but he's like slimy suave. Yeah. No, not really. <laughs> well, definitely more than Jaffin because Jaffin is just bleh. He's wishy washy, just meh. But he's cu- he's cultured. He know he knows his uh, Mahler. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm sure if you replicated dinner, it'd be a great dinner. Yes. But there's something about him that just yeah no. I, I got to disagree with you on this one. If it had been genuine, I, th- I might, I might say, yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Well, it wasn't genuine for either of them. They were both manipulative. It, why does that make make it on your list? Then? I don't know. Just it just the- does. There was something about it that I liked, even though my mind is like, no, Jane Wichcote, Jane Wichcote, nothing else is acceptable. I don't know why I liked it. Yeah, I got, I got to say. I'll go for Janeway and Michael Sullivan, too. <laughs> I know you hate that. I know you hate everything about that. But Makes my skin crawl. <laughs> they just want to sit on the bench and read poetry together. and it's, it's That's cute. only after she manipulated his programming. <laughs> she had to reprogram him to do it. But <laughs> she built a Chakotay imposter. So let me ask you another question, Suzanne. Circling back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the episode... Whether Voyager is the most romantic series or not, let's scratch that question. It's a little hard mm-hmm. to answer. Of all the scenes in Voyager, compared to specific scenes, compared okay. to all the specific romantic scenes in all the other Star Trek series, does Voyager have the most romantic scene compared to any other Star Trek series scene? Oh, gosh. That's, that's a hard one. Like what... I know, because you have to rack all of your Star Trek knowledge here to answer this. Oh, because no, my brain immediately goes to Nurse Chapel and Spock, because that's my original. Really? Yes. Oh, my, don't you speak wow. poorly of Nurse Chapel. I will hurt you. No, no, no. I'm not bad-mouthing at all. I just, it surprised me, because I didn't, I didn't think of it, and it, so it just uh, startled yeah, me a little that's, bit. That's, that's, I'm not criticizing uh, it. Yeah. I love that. So, yeah, oh gosh, I, I can't say that one is better than the other because they, they, oh, they both have their good points and bad points. Yeah, just. Like we could go down the list. Like, do you have a favorite romantic scene from the next generation? <laughs> yes. Although I. Oh, you do. Okay. What is it? <laughs> you do, clearly, I can tell. Okay. <laughs> well, attached. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm a Picard Crusher shipper. And attached, I screamed at my television. I know I did. Yeah. I might have to put Wesley and Robin Leffler high on my list from The Next Generation. How did I know you were going to bring up Robin Leffler? Okay, so so we hit TOS, we hit TNG. How about Deep Space Nine? 
boy, I have to really think, I have to really think about this one. Um, romantic moments in Deep Space Nine. Doesn't roll off the tongue, does it? No, it does not. It does not. Are you a fan of Odo and Kira? Yes, I am. I, I really I'm neutral am. on it. I, they have some great moments, but not overall. It kind of falls a little flat for me. But they have some great moments. I, I I like them more so than than other couples. On I can tell. Yeah. Are you just you're gushing about some of this stuff? See, you're more romantic than you let on, Suzanne. You're no, I'm gushing. not. Don't insult me in such a manner. <laughs> well, in Deep Space Nine, we have also have Cisco and Cassidy Yates. Mm-hmm. I think they're a charming, realistic couple. But I don't think of anything like super romantic about them. So No. no but... They were just a good couple. So I can't think of anything in Deep Space Nine that is as romantic as what I see in Voyager. But yeah. maybe I'm just... Maybe it's just not coming to mind right now. How about the original series? You mentioned Spock and, and Nurse Chapel. Mm-hmm. Well, what about you? I said something. Who's yours from from the original series? Well, there's Kirk and Edith Keeler. Oh, that's just tragic. That's heart wrenching. It's yeah. And that's Ow. see, we're changing genres again. We have comedy, we've got romance, and we've got tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little more of a that's a little more of a Shakespearean tragedy, isn't it? We will so. not be reined in by rules. Yeah, so I got to say, I still have to go Voyager on this one. Like, I can't think of anything off the top of my head in the original series yeah. that comes even close. But uh, Enterprise, mm. there's Trip and T'Pol. They've got a, they've got their moments. On Enterprise, it would have to be Archer and Erica Hernandez, hands down. The rock climbing scenes you're talking about. Yes, yes. But I mean, are those those are those romantic scenes? I guess they're romantic. Yeah, there, there was kissing involved. There was kissing. Okay, sure. <laughs> so, okay, let, let's let's compare now. Is that that if that's the best Enterprise has for mm-hmm. romance? How does it stack up against Voyager? No, oh, no, Voyager. <laughs> yeah, clearly, I think we got to go Voyager on this one. Well, you know, only because we didn't get me any day. we didn't get much more of Captain Hernandez. I would have liked a whole right. lot and more that's of her. A, with a lot of these things, there are missed opportunities that they should have, you know, if they'd gone there a little more, maybe maybe, mm-hmm. we, maybe we would go there more. But, right. And let's bring it home. How about Discovery? Oh. 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 Discovery makes me sad. Well, that definitely has its, you know, almost mature rating on some of the scenes. At, on Discovery, hands down, it's Stamets and Culber. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. There, there's very little that compares with the teeth brushing scene. Yeah, well, that that's just modern. That's just normal everyday life. But even just they're, they're different interactions. Once Culber's dead. Spoiler, if you didn't know. Oh, okay. You're thinking. Sure, sure. So you're thinking po- post death. Yeah. Culber's There's scenes. just right. so many okay. little nuggets of. It's yeah. It's good. I got to say the teeth, the teeth brushing scene, just the everydayness of it. Mm-hmm. You know, just the life as it's lived aspect of it is is. That might rival anything in Voyager. That uh, of everything we've mentioned, that's the one that I kind of go. That's pretty. That's getting really close to <laughs> romantic scenes. Just because of its everydayness, you know, that's, that's yeah. that kind of thing is life. So, yeah. So that that overranks the the television set gift. I'm not sure if it outranks the Doctor and Seven singing "Someone to Watch Over Me." Nothing outranks that in your mind. Yeah, but um, it may be a close second. I, I would say. Yeah, th- this is an interesting "quote unquote" discovery. <laughs> that, uh-huh. that I that, that I, I would go from Voyager immediately to Discovery in terms of romantic scenes. That's that's interesting to discover. So, uh-huh. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> well, it's been fun talking about romance on Voyager for Valentine's Day, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. And, and again, the Kelvins, they're enjoyable to me, but I'm so thrilled I don't have to hang, you know, whatever the need was for them in 2006, that's been 13 years ago. I mean, talk yeah. about water under the bridge and how much things have changed. The way the world looked, media and Star Trek land looked in 2006 
and what the emotion and the vibe and all that was is completely different now. And these movies are a holdover from that, and that's fine. But they, the, our Star Trek world does not depend on them. Earl Grey. It's nice that she gets some revenge at the end because they reverse the whole connection to find them, right? But at the same time, that doesn't like... The ends do not justify the means. Literary Treks. But Tilly feels she's failed. And I think when you're at that age, failure feels almost um, like it's going to annihilate you because you're still quite fragile. Your, your sense of self is still quite fragile. That if something goes wrong, you think it's the end of the world. And in fact, it's only... The, the secret, of course, being a, gr- a grown-up is that when things go wrong, you still feel like it's the end of the world, but you kind of pick yourself up a bit more quickly. But Tilly hasn't had those experiences. It's always been success. The Orb. On top of that, the Ferengi going to the Mirror Universe gives us the opportunity to kind of explore one last time the character of Quark in a way where we are able to see how he's grown. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party podcast apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode, and there are many ways for you to share your thoughts with us. The best place to join in the larger conversation with us is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose Message to a Trek FM Show and select To the Journey. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. Well, speaking of contact information, Suzanne, when you're not busy programming your own Unimatrix, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? Can I put Chakotay in that Unimatrix? It's your Unimatrix. Woohoo! Sure. Multiple Chakotays. <laughs> there are no rules here. Multiple. Well, you can find me popping up every now and again in the Babel Conference. You can also find me on Twitter. My handle is KJaneway8. Wait, was that Unimatrices? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you got one for Chakotay, one for Axum, one for. Okay. No, no, no. It would just be all Chakotay <laughs> all the time. Nobody else. Got it. And Zachary, when you're not trying to find someone to sing a duet of You Are My Sunshine, where can our listeners find you on the internet and around the network? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek.fm as co-host of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy. You can always find me in the Babel Conference if you'd like to talk about Voyager with me in there. And you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. All available through our special patrons website, The Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. There are a few individuals we'd like to thank from around the network. We'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek.fm, and the biggest Robin Leffler fan I know. Our executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, our production manager, and Brandon Shea Mutala, our Patreon manager. And a special thank you and shout out to our five associate producers here on To The Journey. We'd like to thank Bruce Lish, Ju Kim, Richard Marquez, Patrick Carlin, and Norman Lau. Thank you so much for your support of To The Journey and Trek FM. Well, join us next time where we're going to do a cover of Lady Gaga's Bad Romance. But until then, this has been To The Journey. To The Journey.